Do not leave me to the will of my foes, O Lord, for false witnesses rise up against me, and they breathe out violence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, grant us so to celebrate the mysteries of the Lord's passion that we may merit to receive your pardon. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear me, O islands, listen, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb, he gave me my name. He made me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. He made made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Though I thought I had toiled in vain and for nothing, uselessly spent my strength. Yet my reward is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and restore the survivors of Israel, I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will sing of your salvation. I will will sing sing of your your salvation. salvation. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, Rescue me and deliver me. Incline your ear to me and save me. I will we'll sing, sing of your salvation. salvation. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety. For you are my rock and my fortress. O oh my God, rescue me from the hand of the wicked. I will, I will sing, sing of your salvation. salvation. For you are my hope, O oh Lord. My trust, O oh God, from my youth. On you I depend from birth. From my mother's womb, you are my strength. I will sing of your salvation. My mouth shall declare your justice, day by day your salvation. O God, you have taught me from my youth. Until the present, I proclaim your wondrous deeds. I will sing of your salvation. Hail to you, our King, obedient to the Father. You were led to your crucifixion like a gentle lamb to the slaughter. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Reclining at table with his disciples, Jesus was deeply troubled and testified, Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another at a loss as to whom he meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said to him, Master, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I hand the morsel after I have dipped it. So he dipped the morsel and took it and handed it to Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot. After Judas took the morsel, Satan entered him. 
So Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now none of those reclining at table realized why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Jesus had told him, Buy what we need for the feast, or to give something to the poor. So Judas took the morsel and left at once, and it was night. When he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. He will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I told the Jews, where I go you cannot come, so now I say it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Master, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going you cannot follow me now, though you will follow later. Peter said to him, Master, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say to you, the cock will not crow before you deny me three times. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We have some very, very encouraging words from the prophet Isaiah in our first reading. Um, certainly in one of those uh, passages, um, as mo- pretty much all of the book of Isaiah, uh, a great majority of it, is directed towards uh, the Messiah, directed towards Jesus. And the, this uh, prophecy in particular speaks about how uh, the the Messiah, so Jesus, is going to be the one that's going to restore not just the Jewish nation, not just be their Messiah, but is going to restore all people, is going to be um, a light to all the nations so that God's salvation can reach everyone. Again, not just limited to the Jewish nation. But before that, um, there are some very, uh, there's some very, I'd say, realistic words that are very helpful for us, I think especially in a, in a trying and difficult time such as we're in. Uh, that speaks about the hardship that the Messiah is going to, is going through, and the prophet Isaiah is kind of speaking uh, through the Messiah's, um, is speaking it in the uh, in the mouth of the Messiah, so to speak. And so it says, "Though I thought I had toiled in vain, and for nothing uselessly spent my strength, yet my reward is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God." Those uh, the, 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 that little verse there, I think, really sums up the struggle of the spiritual life. Though I thought I had toiled in vain and for nothing uselessly spent my strength. And brothers and sisters, so much of our Lord's work in our lives is hidden. We don't see it. It's not readily um, obvious to us. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we're blessed to be able to see um, a particular grace. We're able to see God working in a a, uh, powerful way. And, And certainly he wants to show forth his power in our life so that we can see it. Um, And so I'm not saying we never see God's work far from. We see God's work all the time. But the, uh, the majority of it, I think we could say, right, God's working on human hearts, conversion, that kind of thing, oftentimes is going to be hidden. It's going to not be as obvious. And so what then is required from us is to be faithful, right, to be faithful even in the midst of suffering, to be faithful in pursuing Jesus no matter what. Even though when we feel like we're toiling, we're working, we're pursuing God in vain and for nothing, <laughs> uselessly spending our strength, spending our efforts, when it seems to be coming to nothing. And we certainly see this in the life of Jesus, right? In one, and he can certainly make these words his own, in that through much of his earthly ministry, right, he was constantly opposed by the scribes, Pharisees, uh, people that rejected him, even after seeing, even after seeing outward manifestations of his power, mir- uh, even after seeing his miracles, there were many who rejected him. And then we have uh, Simon Peter, St. Peter, who at will deny Jesus. And then we also have Judas, who outright betrays him. And so we certainly see the suffering and the toil, which at a human level seems to come to nothing. And yet the resurrection, which we're going to celebrate here in a few days, is what overturns all of that. And shows that, no, because Jesus is faithful to the mission the Father had given to him, all of that is renewed. Right? Salvation is able to be brought to every single person. And so, my brothers and sisters, in a similar way in our lives, when we are faithful to Jesus, and we are faithful to the Father's will in our own lives, no matter how difficult it might seem, no matter how, 
uh, much it might seem like we're spinning our wheels spiritually and uh, nothing's getting done or it seems in our view nothing's getting done or we don't seem to be growing closer to God or growing in faith, hope, and charity. If we're remaining faithful to Jesus, if we, are, if we have a life of prayer, if we are staying connected to the sacraments, if we are pursuing Jesus above everything else, if he's the goal of our life, then yes, we do get to see God's glory. Right? We get to be made glorious in the sight of the Lord because it's his work, not ours. And so my brothers and sisters, as we continue to celebrate this Holy Mass, let's ask the Lord for this grace, that we might be faithful to him no matter what, no matter how much it might seem like our toil is in vain or how much it might seem like our strength is being spent uselessly. Because in Christ, it is always, it is always brought to perfection and it is always brought um, to greater glory than we could possibly ever imagine. Now let us offer to our Heavenly Father our prayers and our needs. For all members of the church, may Christ strengthen us as we share the good news of the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For leaders and those who carry responsibility for the welfare of others, may Jesus guide them in the ways of servant leadership. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are struggling or suffering in the midst of these uncertain times, may God's love and presence with them bring consolation and comfort. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the community of believers, through the reach of this live stream, may God open our hearts more fully and increase our faith in him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, for lives lost to the coronavirus, and all Holy Family parishioners who died on this date, including Mary Teresa McGinty, Louis Labine, Aileen Sanders, Ernest Pappenheimer, and Virginia Pulaski. May they rest in the loving presence of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions of Rachel Dyer, for whom this Mass is offered, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you please hear and answer these prayers and all the prayers we hold in our hearts. For they are all made to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For through your goodness, we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands to the praise and glory of his name for our good and the good of all his holy church. Look favorably, O Lord, we pray on these offerings of your family. And to those you make partakers of these sacred gifts, grant a share in their fullness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, our, and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for the days of his saving passion and glorious resurrection are approaching, by which the pride of the ancient foe is vanquished, and the mystery of our redemption in Christ is celebrated. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and we profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. 
Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Earl, our Bishop, Carl, our Bishop Emeritus, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs of eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare say, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I, I am not worthy that you that should, should enter, enter under my roof, but, but only say, say the word, and my, and my soul, soul shall be healed. healed. God did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all.
we invite all you who are joining us now at home to pray the prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present here in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there. I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Nourished by your saving gifts, we beseech your, your mercy, Lord, that by the same sacrament with which you have fed us in the present age, you may make us partakers of life eternal through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May your mercy, O God, cleanse the people that are subject to you from all seduction of former ways and make them capable of new holiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. St. Michael, the, the archangel, archangel, defend us in battle. battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us through our little technical difficulties. My mic went out, so uh, apparently we, it's, uh, and I, it's hard for me to notice that when I'm up there. So, but we got it all worked out, I think, right? I, I'm back on. Okay, I'm back on. So, good. Um, so we're still going to do question and answer today, but, um, so you can get those questions in. But before that, we're going to just do a little, um, a short little teaching on the foot washing that we normally do on Holy Thursday, um, just because we're not going to be doing that this year. And so uh, I think the plan was then is we're going to be putting some directions on Facebook for a suggestion for them to do it at home. Is that, I think, I think that's the, what the thought was now. And so we're just going to uh, talk a little bit about that. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, the foot washing is a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful part of the uh, Holy Week liturgies. It happens on Holy Thursday. Um, it happens right after the homily. And uh, what, what happens is, is the gospel for that night is from uh, John, and it's uh, from John's version of the, uh, of the Last Supper. And it's interesting, John doesn't talk about the Eucharist at in the Last Supper in his version. Um, he does that earlier in, uh, in Ch John chapter 6. But um, Jesus has this long extended, uh, actually a couple of chapters worth of words to his disciples before he, uh, before he undergoes his passion. And during the course of that, uh, John talks about how Jesus gets up uh, from the meal and then ties the towel around, takes off his outer garment and ties the towel around his waist and goes through and washes all the disciples' feet. And so um, we take that right from, you know, right from the gospel there. Um, and it's really an imitation of, of Jesus. And normally the way it happens uh, on Holy Thursday is the priest does the same thing and we have um, 12 people and 12 volunteers or 12 voluntolds. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes people are more or less eager to have their, have their uh, uh, feet washed. But anyway, um, we do that and it's, it's a way of people to see that in action, right? And kind of the, I guess the, the spiritual um, component of it, uh, it really just it shows that, um, you know, the level to which Jesus goes, right, to, to save us, right? That he descends down to the um, the dirtiest part of ourselves. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, washing someone's feet was something that you wouldn't really even require of, like, your lowest house slave. Like, you would, in order to wash someone's feet, you would give them water to bathe their feet, right? So that if someone entered a house and they were dirty, um, then you would provide them water so that they could wash their own feet. But uh, you would never wash another person's uh, uh, foot um, because they were gross and stinky. <laughs> and so um, that's, and that's so Jesus is saying something really tremendously powerful when, when he goes through and, and does that. And, uh, and so that's, that's what uh, is imitated here. It's really showing that he is a uh, servant, right? And he mentions that to the, the disciples after he has done that. Um, he says, do you realize what I've done for you? And if I then the master um, and teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Um, and so that's a uh, we follow that direction literally during the um, you know, during the washing of the feet on Holy uh, Holy Thursday. Um, but then, obviously, it's meant to then be a spiritual attitude, right? That we take into every area of our life is one of humility, right? That um, as Jesus, it was uh, was humble among us, right? Among his creatures, right? Um, uh, that Jesus came to save us, and he came to save us through through serving us, that we're called to know less. We are called to serve others in that same way, right? In that uh, that humility of heart, um, putting ourselves at the uh, service of others. And Jesus repeats that throughout the Gospels, right? Those who want to be the first of all must be the slaves of all, right? The first will be last, the last will be first. Um, that in, in the divine economy, so to speak, uh, things are flipped around, right? Um, that those, who, uh, that those who seem to be the weakest and the most without power in the sight of the world are the ones that are first and that are the ones that um, God views as uh, the ones that are, um, you know, especially worthy of his love, his attention and concern. Um, certainly everybody is, but a humble heart, that's, that is what really attracts uh, the Lord. And so, um, and then so that, that's something that we'd also encourage too. So if, if you have the, um, when we put the directions out there about how to do it, that's something that you could uh, do uh, following along um, during the Holy Holy Thursday 
um, liturgy as a way of uh, showing that um, uh, showing that humility and service uh, to family members, family members or um, that uh, that were that we're with now. Um, especially sometimes family can be it can be hard to, to love each other. Families, so uh, having that kind of uh, act of humility is, is always it's always good for us, right? Um, Exactly, especially when we're trapped in the house, right? And it's it's easy to uh, yeah, it's it's easy um, to be doing anything except trying to practice humility. So um, yeah, so that's so that'd be a, it's going to be a great great practice. So yeah, that's just a little bit of a, a teaching about what we're um, about what we're about on Holy Thursday and, and where it comes from. And so we certainly encourage uh, all of you to to participate in that in, in any way that uh, that you can. And uh, yeah, so with that, I think we'll uh, look and see if we've got any questions here. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll repeat that question. So the question is, if God knows exactly what we need, why do we pray for specific, certain intentions? Is that okay? Yes. So good question. Um, Yes, and Jesus actually says that in the Gospels. Uh, he says that your Father knows what you need uh, before you ask Him. Um, but yet He still commands us to pray. And uh, so and that's, a, that's a great... Um, yeah, and we could also say, well, if God already knows what we need and, and what's going to happen, why, why bother to pray? And really the answer is, is that prayer... Um, it, when we pray, sometimes we have a... I think, I, know, I, I think sometimes we have a mechanistic view of prayer. Right? I say so many prayers and I get a certain thing to happen, right? Kind of like the uh, divine vending machine. I think some people are familiar with that. I say, you know, 10 Hail Marys and then God better give me the A on my test or, or whatever. Um, and that's not what prayer is about, right? Now, God wants us to pray. There's many different forms of prayer. I mean, petitions, that's where we're petitioning for our needs. Um, God certainly wants us to do that. And uh, he wants to answer those prayers. However, he know because he knows what we need better than we do. He wants us to ask, but then he also wants us to have the humility, right, to be open to receiving it, however he wants to give to it. Um, and so I've, I've heard the uh, you know, three answers to prayer uh, that God has is um, is yes, not yet, or I have something better in mind, right. And so sometimes when we you get the answer of no to our prayers. We just look at it as no and, oh, I didn't get what I want, right? Um, which can be, you know, if we allow that to grow too much, it can kind of be a childish attitude, right? I didn't get what I wanted, therefore God must not love me, right? And certainly we see that in the, the human realm, um, you know, with uh, parents and their kids. That's, you know, that's absolutely ridiculous if we just think about that. I mean, a parent that gave their child everything they asked for, well, the child probably wouldn't live, you know, beyond five minutes. So, um, because the parents know what's best for the child, right? And so the same way with God, to a much greater degree, he knows what is ultimately best for us. And so, um, yes, he knows what we need. Uh, he knows what we need better than we do. So when we pray, we're more, um, we're not so much, again, trying to get God to do something. We are trying to form our wills around his, so we say, God, here's what's going on in my life. Here's what I think I need, you know, given my circumstances or the situation I find myself in. I bring that to you, but help me to accept whatever it is that, um, that you want, right? Whatever it is, because you know what's truly best for me. Um, we see Jesus modeling that in the prayer of uh, Gethsemane, right, in the garden. He prays that if it's possible, if there is a way outside of the passion for for the salvation to be accomplished for the human race, he asks, you know, let it pass by. Let this tribulation, um, let this passion pass by me. But he doesn't stop the prayer there, right? That's, that's, the, that's the first part of his prayer. But then he says, yet not my will, but your will be done. And so, um, you know, Jesus is, is certainly shuddering, you know, going through, um, you know, ex experiencing, and not so much, I mean, certainly, the physical part of the passion was torturous, but worse than that was the spiritual part of um, him having to, without committing sin, experiencing the effects of sin, right? Experiencing that, um, that aloneness, right? That, uh, that separateness from God um, in, in place of the human race. And so, um, you know, certainly something we, we can't even begin to imagine what that would have been like for Jesus, right? Someone that was totally in union with God to in some way being experienced being having the experience of being a sinner without actually without actually being one um, and so we can imagine why 
Jesus would not want to go through that. And yet, even in that prayer, he says, but you know, the most important thing is your will, not mine, be done. And so I think taking that attitude of prayer in the same way is, uh, yeah, is, is essential for us. So sorry, that one went on kind of long, but that's a great, pr- that's a great question. Anytime I have a chance to talk about prayer, I will. So, <clears throat> okay, so we got one here. Oops. Okay, I have always been confused about the story of Judas, and he was condemned from the beginning. Jesus knew he was going to betray him. Someone had to do it, and when he repented and took money back, do you think he was forgiven? This is another fantastic question. So um, why did Judas, um, you know, was Judas somehow condemned by God from the beginning to do this? And uh, no, so this is one of, um, this is, we're going to get into kind of some deep stuff here about God's foreknowledge and our free will. So um, I'll start with this. Simply because someone has information that doesn't, um, guarantee a certain outcome, right? So simply because God knows something that's going to happen, he obviously knows the past, the present, and the future. All time is present to him. So he knows exactly what we're going to do. He knows exactly where we're going to end up. Um, simply because God has that knowledge does not limit our free will. Those are two separate things. Um, someone having the knowledge about something um, is different than us actually doing the thing. And um, a, uh, I think we, we got a similar question. Actually, it was a really good question from uh, our eighth graders, I think, at one point in the year. And the way I kind of explained it, and this is not a perfect analogy, so bear with me, um, but I think it helps get the point across. Um, so what I told them is I'm a big fan of ice cream. I love ice cream. So um, if I could have it every day, I probably would. So, that's why lunch has been really good for me. <laughs> anyway, um, so we have a really great ice cream shop in here called, or uh, in town called Ziggy's. And again, I would love to go there every single day, especially when it gets open. Let's say I did it. Let's say I went every, every week. We'll make my, myself be a, l- a little more realistic, right? So I go to Ziggy's every week. And let's say I want a, jo- a chocolate peanut butter flurry. And I go there and I order it same day, same time, every week. I see the same person there. They take my order at the same time. Well, after a few weeks, they see me coming each time. They know that they can already start getting the peanut butter and the chocolate ready because they know that, right? They, they have experience of me. They know something about me. Well, simply because they know that, that doesn't force me to then order a chocolate peanut butter flurry. I could go up there and I could just as well order a strawberry one or something else, right? I still have that freedom um, simply because they know, and even if they can predict correctly, even if they know correctly that I'm going to order my favorite thing, um, that does not prevent them from, or that does not prevent me from still having that freedom. That's obviously a very uh, poor analogy, but uh, in, it communicates the point that God knows he has much more information about us, about our hearts. And so, of course, he can know what we're going to do, but that doesn't change the fact that um, and of course, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know that though. So we are still free. Um, that doesn't change the fact that we're still free. So to get back to the, the answer here, Judas was still free. He was not, um, uh, you know, he, he was not forced to betray Jesus. Even after he betrayed Jesus, um, he still could have been forgiven. And actually, um, uh, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen talks about this. He talks about the difference between St. Peter and Judas, that, um, that they both regretted what they had done. Right? If you remember, St. Peter is sorry for, um, for denying Jesus, and he goes out and uh, he weeps bitterly. Judas is sorry for, what, for betraying Jesus, and he goes and he flings the money back into the temple to the uh, Pharisees. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just waving by to someone. <laughs> our, our, our good deacon, good and holy deacon, was uh, ready to head out. Um, and, uh, and so they both repent, but the difference is, is that Judas then goes off and uh, kills himself, right? Um, and Peter later, St. Peter later goes and um, he repents, right? He repents to, to the Lord. And so uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen would say that the difference is, is that um, St. Peter repented unto the Lord and Judas repented unto himself, right? That yes, forgiveness would have been there for Judas if, um, if he had, you know, maybe come back later and, um, you know, had... Uh, had repented, and, and, and Jesus certainly would have forgiven him, um, but Judas, uh, you know, Judas rejected that, right? And, and, and I would say this too, um, we know that Judas, you know, went off and, and uh, killed himself, but we don't know his eternal destiny, right? The Catholic Church has never said that a particular person is in hell. 
Uh, Jesus warns about the reality of hell and warns about the possibility of going there. But the only, um, the only persons we know for certain are in hell would be the devil and his angels. Um, so because we never know the moment of when someone died where their heart was at. And so only God knows that. So we hope, and we certainly hope and pray that at his last moments that Judas repented, but um, from all exterior evidence that we have, um, right, we, we, don't, we don't have evidence that Judas repented uh, to, to the Lord in the same way that St. Peter did. Um, and, you know, so uh, Archbishop um, Fulton Sheen says that the great tragedy of Judas is that he could have been St. Judas, right? And that we could have, uh, I remember seeing, you know, someone else write that, you know, we could have had, the feast of the conversion or of the repentance of St. Judas, right? He very well, um, we, have the, we have a feast of the conversion of St. Paul, right? So we have someone that was a, a, a cruel murderer and persecutor of Christians, and he ended up being one of their greatest saints. So it certainly could have been the same for Judas. And so we just see that, um, that drama, right? The drama of, of, of decision of to be for or against God that all of us have to make. So uh, yeah, that, that is a fantastic question because it leads us into a, a whole lot of things between our free will and God. So thank you for asking that. That's, that's fantastic. How long do souls stay in purgatory? Is it years and years? Wow, you guys are great today. So um, you're always great, but these are, these are really uh, great questions. Um, I have no idea. Right? <laughs> Again, that would, be, that would be up to God. Um, we have to be very careful after when we talk about years or days off of purgatory, which the church used to use that language, um, talked about so many days or years or months off of purgatory for doing certain prayers. Um, we have to be very, very careful when we say, you know, after death, how is time experienced? Um, it is almost a guarantee, I would say, that it is not experienced like we experience it now. Um, you know, in the, the, the second letter, it's the second letter of St. Peter, um, the author says, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, don't forget this, that one day with God is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day, right? Um, and so our perception of time, especially in, in purgatory, um, well, it's, it's not going to be like here on earth, right? Once we are, if we're in purgatory, for the souls in purgatory, they are in eternity in, in a sense, Right? Um, they are going to go to heaven, right? So if, if a soul's in purgatory, they cannot be lost. They will go to heaven eventually. Uh, but how, do, how does one measure time? We really don't know. Um, you know, the only measurement, so to speak, would be of growing in greater holiness and love for God, right? So the souls that are in purgatory are there because there is some part of them yet that are not perfected in the love of God. They're not ready to go to heaven yet, although they will. Um, and so it could vary wildly, right? You could have maybe um, people that are saints now or very, very holy people that spend, again, I'm going to use the word, you know, relatively little time, so to speak, in purgatory because they're ready, they're ready to go. You could have someone that lived a very wicked and evil life and at the last moment they repented and were sorry for their sins and God's able to use that last ounce of repentance to to get them uh, to get them into purgatory, but because of uh, the way they've lived their life, they are not ready. They're not nearly ready to enter into into heaven, and so they might have to spend spend a longer time in purgatory. Um, and then you can have everywhere in between. Um, so we you know we have no idea how long certain it would it would certainly it's going to depend on the soul and where their relationship with God stands. Which is why this brings us back to a very important part for us is uh, that's why it's so essential for us to pray for the souls in purgatory. Um, they rely on our prayers. We, we need and we owe them our prayers. That's why I always tell people, um, you know, uh, especially if you have parents that have passed away, that commandment to honor your father and mother, that extends beyond this life. And that's why we have masses offered up on behalf of the dead. We can pray our rosary, divine mercy chaplet. Um, you know, we can, we can offer prayers and sacrifices up for the souls in purgatory. There, that's one of my big devotions, actually, is to the souls in purgatory, uh, particularly because they can't, they can't help themselves, um, at least it's our common understanding, and that they're also going to remember it, right? Um, and if, if you're like me, if, uh, if you, I, I mean, you know, if you're going to have some imperfections when you pass from this earth, most, most likely, I think, for me, knowing that other, you know, if you help a soul get into heaven, that that soul is certainly going to remember it. So if you're in purgatory, they'll be interceding and praying for you from heaven. 
um, I, you know, I think that's certainly something that we can expect. And so uh, praying and interceding for the souls in purgatory now while we're alive and on this earth and have the opportunity to do that is essential. It's a responsibility, and it's, it's one we should accept uh, joyfully to do that. So pray for the souls of purg in purgatory. Pray for them every day. Um, they need it. So uh, great, great question here. Um, okay, and I think that may have taken us to the end. Oh, oh okay. Yes, well, I'm being told that it is... Um, no, I, I knew this, of course, before I know. It is, uh, it is Father Joe's uh, birthday today. So happy birthday to Father Joe. Wish him a happy birthday. I believe he is 1,001 today. Yeah, I think he's 1,001. Maybe it's 1,002. Anyway, wish him 1,000 and the third happy birthday. Um, no, I think he's, uh, he's yeah, oh, okay, he's, he's, the big, he's the big 50, 50. So basically 1,000 years, right? That's I mean, at that point, you know, come on. You just, I mean, this is the fountain of youth right now, right? I mean, Father Joe, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should stop. I should stop. We should, we should really just, we should end this live stream right now because I'm going to, no. Happy birthday to Father Joe. Uh, wish him a happy birthday, happy 50th. And um, yeah, so uh, happy birthday to Father Joe and hope he has a blessed, uh, blessed day today. And hope all of you have a blessed day. So uh, take care and God bless.